Welcome. Thanks so much for uh, joining us here today. Uh, this is the first of um, hopefully many conversations that we get to have like this. Uh, we've talked about doing this for a long time now. Um, oftentimes on a Sunday, uh, you know, we only have so much time to be able to dig into a certain topic. And uh, we oftentimes have the desire to be able to go deeper and there's just not enough time. Or maybe, uh, you know, questions are asked of us. And uh, so we thought maybe this would be um, just a, a, a good format casually to be able to kind of dig in a little bit more. And so um, we had an awesome uh, message from Pastor David Rublid on Sunday and uh, kind of sparked a number of other questions and things that we'd like to talk a little bit about. So we're going to we're going to do that today. But before we dive into that, I'd like to um, some of you guys know us, some of you don't. Um, maybe you do attend our church. Maybe you just catch us online sometimes. And so we're going to take the opportunity to uh, introduce ourselves a little bit. So let's let's start over here with with David. Awesome. I'm David Rublet. I'm one of the pastors here at Life Church, and uh, I'm passionate about the Bible. I'm passionate about how to read the Bible, what's in it. I'm passionate about Christianity, the whole history of Christianity, and uh, I like giving uh, ways in which people could consider and reconsider Jesus. And so, if people have walked away and want to reconsider uh, or wrestling with their faith uh, for many different reasons, uh, I love walking into those spaces and, and talking with people and uh, inviting them to reconsider some things about Jesus. So, yeah. Awesome. Then, over here, we have Brian. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Baker. Um, I'm a teacher, so I get to teach APUS history and APUS government and politics as well as some philosophy courses at, uh, at a charter school in the Phoenix area. I've also uh, done some graduate studies in political science and theology. Uh, before that, I was in the uh, U.S. Army. Um, I'm really passionate about Christian education, and specifically, um, so for me, Acts 17 is the most interesting chapter in all of Scripture because I'm so interested in how you sort of relate the gospel in a secular setting um, to students who might not have heard about Christ. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. <clears throat> and I, uh, my name is David Martinez. Um, I am the worship leader, worship director, worship pastor, whatever you want to call me, here at Life Church Peoria. And uh, I've been leading worship as, as a job, I guess, for about 12 years now. Um, at a few different churches over the years, and so I've been a part of this conversation about worship and, and music uh, for, for a long time now, and I've been able to see it already shift and take different forms, and so, um, yeah, I really, really love serving here at this church, and I, I love I love music, I love worship, so I'm excited to, to be able to have this conversation with you guys today, and um, so I th let's dive right on into the first question I have for, for you, Brian. Um, Pastor David gave us a quick overview of Athens uh, for the sake of the sermon. And um, what, what else can you tell us about the history and culture of Athens? Okay, so again, if, if, you, if you like philosophy, this is like the best chapter in all of scripture. Um, so Athens is probably everyone knows, yes, it's a cultural center, it's a philosophical center. Um, you know, if you've seen, you know, Hollywood movies, uh, you've seen, you know, Athenians depicted defeating the Persian Empire, like this is where all of that went down. For our purposes today, what's super interesting for me is the historical context is really Socrates and specifically the trial of Socrates. OK, so in 399 B.C., Socrates is put on trial for introducing foreign gods to Athens, just like Paul is doing, um, and for corrupting the youth of Athens, okay? And so Socrates, 400 years before this goes down, he goes on trial, it's a religious trial, probably in the, the same location that Paul is going to be on trial. Um, and it's super clear, at least to me, that this is what Luke is referencing. He's alluding to it. And I just want to point out a few things. So I'm getting this from J. Andrew uh, Cowan, a, a theologian, and he's pointing out these allusions to like the trial of Socrates in Acts 17. So first of all, Paul is, um, he's engaging in philosophy in the Agora, which is the Athenian marketplace, okay? Usually when Paul goes around, we see him in, in the synagogue, you know, we see him in various locations, but Luke is very clear to be like, look, this is exactly where Socrates used to dialogue, okay, the same location. 
Uh, second, just the word that Luke uses here for what Paul is doing is dialegomai, which is like what we would consider Socratic dialogue. And that word is not used a whole lot in Acts. Um, and then third, which I've already pointed out, like Paul is on trial. If it is a trial, there's some debate on that for the same exact charge, like introducing foreign divinities. And then a fourth um, thing I'd like to point out on my own, which is definitely historical context, is if you go to, I told you I was going to nerd out about this, okay? If you go, go to Plato's it. Republic, probably his most famous work, okay? Socrates, it starts, Socrates is walking back from the port of Piraeus back up to Athens. And Polemarchus and some other people, like, so Polemarchus sends a slave, like, go, like, stop Socrates. And the slave, like, puts his, he grabs him, okay? Like, there's force involved. And then Polemarchus catches up and he's like, Socrates, like, you have to come and, and philosophize with us, basically, at my dad's house. And Socrates is like, I don't really know if I want to. And Polemarchus says, we can use force to make you. Like, there's more of us than there are of you. And so I'm not saying Socrates is actually forced to dialogue, but clearly Plato is pointing that out. And then if we look at what happens to Paul in Acts 17, is he is forced to go to the Areopagus. Uh, so that I think there's four allusions there that really point to that historical context. Can you talk a little bit about the Areopagus? What, what is it? So the Areopagus, um, it was supposed to be where Ares, had, you know, in mythology, had been put on trial, I believe for killing Poseidon's son. So historically they would do, they would try capital cases there and they would try religious cases there. I also, sorry, I also probably should have said this. Uh, I firmly believe that God is going to set certain people up to preach the gospel in very particular contexts. And so, according to N.T. Wright, about a hundred years before this goes down, uh, the Athenians were involved in this power play against Rome. Okay, they sort of rebelled. There was a war. The Roman uh, uh, general Sulla ended up putting it down. And they trashed Athens, just like Jerusalem is going to be, you know, raised in 70 AD. And they expelled a lot of the leading citizens and philosophers of Athens. They exiled them. You have to leave Athens. And they went to Tarsus, which was where Saul, Paul was born, okay? So Tarsus becomes this center of, like, Athenian philosophy. And so, like, when Paul gets there, in some ways he's coming, like, home intellectually. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah that's, why, that's why he's, he's, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but that's kind of why he's so versed, even in their poems, that within his sermon, and I talk about this Sunday too, uh, I highlight, I almost, I almost read past it. I had to like stop myself to point it out. That's why he knows their poems and their works. He's, he's kind of brought up in this culture in Tarsus. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Well, uh, Pastor David gave us a really simple overview um, of the Epicureans and the Stoics. Um, what else can you tell us about these two schools of philosophy? So let's start with the Epicureans. Uh, what I think is very relevant for us is sort of how it plays out today. So the first thing I would point out is I think most Americans are either Epicurean or Stoic to a certain extent. Um, so Epicureans, the gods might exist, but they're far away, uh, sort of like a deist would believe, as, as uh, Pastor Rubel had pointed out on Sunday. Um, there's a lot of stuff with, like, they have this very materialistic worldview, so they think there's no life after death. We're all basically atoms sort of randomly colliding around. Uh, life ends, the soul, like, once you die, that's it. And so for them, there is no afterlife, and the goal of life is to maximize pleasure and minimize suffering, both physical and mental. Um, and this is basically the modern Western worldview. Uh, it's basically atheistic, though the Epicureans would have said maybe, you know, there are some gods maybe far away. 
Uh, but let's maximize pleasure. Let's minimize suffering. And if if that's not America, I don't know what is. Did you have a comment? Yeah, yeah I, talk through because we've had some people, especially in modernism. Um, so if you're if if you're watching in the 1700s, we had the Age of Enlightenment, and and deism was one of those that were, I talked about in my sermon where. Where basically Thomas Jefferson was a deist, uh, you know, there was, there's a belief in a God, but there's no supernatural, no miracles, no virgin birth, only the natural. But it seems like when I look at history, and you could maybe speak to this, right after that, on the heels of that was known as the modernist era. And one of the key kind of players in Epicureanism, from what I saw, it was Erasmus Darwin. Mm-hmm who was actually Charles Darwin's grandpa, who actually wrote one of the first, uh, I guess you could say, theories on modern evolution. Mm -hmm. And some people say Charles Darwin, now I don't want to get into creation accounts and the arguments, I don't even want to have wars about those, but it seems like after Charles Darwin's 10-year-old daughter died his mind shift started shifting back towards epicurean thought where before he was on track to be clergy and now it's this question is is there a god is there a god who involves himself in our world and it seems like the modern era if you could talk a little bit about eras and where we are now kind of in eras it seems like where we are now is kind of on the heels of some of even those thought where there was almost like an acceleration of epicureanism within the modern age which is like the 1800s that's kind of a brief example of that time period but could you speak to that just a little bit i I think that's absolutely true i think that Increasingly in our society, people don't believe in God. They believe that all that exists is matter. And Epicureanism, like Stoicism, is largely... They're trying to answer the problem of pain. Like how do we, why is there pain and suffering in the world? How do we respond to it? And so the Epicureans, like most modern people today, would say there's pain and suffering in the world because we're just... We're just matter and we all have our free will or whatever and we're just harming each other and what can you do about that pain you can try to minimize it Um, and then you're going to die and it's all going to go away the stoic response is basically to grin and bear it Um, now that's not a very high view of stoicism but that's how most people live it out Um, stoicism has there's a lot of great things about it but bertrand russell he said that uh, if he was right, famous atheist, if he was right and there was no God and all, if all there was was matter, then the proper response to that was, quote, unyielding despair, uh, which is, I think is a, a more realistic like, response. If you don't believe in God, I don't know if I answered your question or not. <laughs> no, that's good. I, I, I just was thinking uh, primarily about uh, different eras and we've we kind of want i mean the conversation was 10 years ago we're now in a postmodern era where uh it opened up kind of some different framework and thought for the individual um but i didn't i, I didn't know necessarily how much the modernist era because you're on the heels of of the enlightenment which Deism was key. It's almost like deism was kind of like the open gate for Epicurean thought Mm -hmm. to kind of accelerate back into our culture. Because it was, it was, you saw some of the values of Epicurean epicureanism uh, up until that point but it's almost like it, it has accelerated and it's back on the playing field even to the point where people say would even at least in the 1800s were saying yeah I, i'm an epicurean which you didn't really hear yeah. again up until that point so to, yeah. to be an epicurean at least in the popular sense okay is to worship yourself so you know how many ever Americans we have, I don't know what it is, 300 million. Like, like we are like Athens. Paul walks through Athens and he says the city is full of idols. Well, if we have 300 million people in this country, we've got at least 300 million idols, okay? And so the Epicurean, they're living for themselves. And again, there is a higher view of, of Epicureanism where virtue would be involved, but that's not how we really see it played out. If you're just living to maximize your pleasure and minimize your pain, 
that's going to involve harming other people, I think, anyway. Awesome. And so if you were going to put Epicureans and, and Stoics, if you were going to maybe bring it down to just like a couple words, like Stoic, you said, grin and bear it, mm -hmm. right? And then for Epicureans, what, what would you say? Just, pl you know, maximize pleasure. YOLO. Feel good? YOLO. <laughs> you only that's live good. once. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Can you speak to, before we move on, can you speak to some of the spiritual belief system within Stoicism? So the Stoics were pantheists, though some, like Epictetus, did allow that maybe there was a personal God. But your average Stoic, there is not a personal God, uh, but there is a much more of an emphasis on virtue. And there also is this big emphasis on just not letting the ups and downs of life impact you, uh, which is, I think, one of the really good things we can get from Stoicism even to this day. But the negative side of that would be repression. Like, we're just going to ignore all of the bad that happens. Uh, but I think our churches are full of Stoics. I'm sure you guys have heard of moral therapeutic deism. Yeah, yeah. Right? This... Uh, worldview that says we need to be moral, so we need to be good. Uh, we want to feel good. And there is a God somewhere out there like doing stuff, but he's detached. I think there are so many people in our churches that don't have a true relationship with Christ, and they're basically Stoics. Or maybe we, we acknowledge him during funerals or weddings or, or, or moments, you know, yeah. where, where it seems as though it helps us cope. Yeah. Yeah. This might be not what you're looking for, but I also think if we're looking at the political left in America, we're much more likely to see Epicureans. And if we're looking at the political right, we're much more likely to see Stoics, just in general. That's fascinating. All right. That's good. Good stuff. Um, I'll shift over to you, to you, David. Um, the term pluralism was used on Sunday um, in comparing Athens with the U.S., which is fascinating. What is it? And what are some of the obstacles for how Christian community is, is living? Yeah, pluralism basically is the belief that there are multiple belief systems, multiple gods, and these beliefs and these belief systems can sit together in society. Uh, there's also I've seen it also said another way to even view multiple beliefs in, sitting together are multiple views to one God even could sit within pluralism. And pluralism, probably the best way to say that we see it playing out in our society are the people that have the coexist bumper stickers on the back of their car. But pluralism has been around. And um, one of the fascinating things, I could speak to this because, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I come from here to Life Church from Anglican roots, and I'm still kind of a, a tied to an Anglican diocese, which is, comes from England. One of the things in history was in the Western world, people were just Christian. You know, you were born in the church, you were baptized as a baby, you were confirmed. Uh, and that was just kind of how discipleship was done. But then as kind of the, the Western world expanded and missionary movements happened, uh, they go into places like India where there's millions of gods. And that's, that's pluralism as pluralism can get. And they have to figure out, okay, like, how do I do ministry now? And so there, there's this tension for people who have just kind of always known this Christian worldview, this Christian way of life. And what our world is doing and our nation is doing, like, I'm not the type of person who necessarily believes that we were ever really founded as a Christian nation, other than the fact the Puritans came over from, uh, from I guess you could say, say, say England. But over time, like I talked about before, we had deism, we had Epicureanism, all these different belief systems that sat. And since the revivalist movements in the 1800s, it brought us back as a nation to kind of a Christian worldview. But what we're seeing right now in America, if I could speak to America, is we're seeing America move into kind of both individualism, um, but also... Uh, multiple belief systems sitting together. So in the mid-century, say 50, 60 years ago, religious diversity was, are you Presbyterian? Are you Catholic? Are you Baptist? You know, are you Methodist? And it was all these different branches within Christianity. But now what we see as 
as religious diversity in our nation is we see Wiccans, we see atheists, we see agnostic, uh, we see Buddhists, we see Christians, and it, it, our, our, the way our nation is moving, our, our nation is moving to a place where there are multiple belief systems outside of the idea of just being a Christian society. And so pluralism is kind of, I would say, the creed of our world that's shifting, and it's kind of the creed of America that's shifting more and more from what it was that our grandparents knew it and our great-grandparents knew it. Multiple beliefs sitting together. So, yeah. And Brian, can you, can you speak to that a little bit too through the lens of families, children, education? Sure. Uh, from my experience as a teacher, it's very clear that the mission field has come to us. That's the great side of pluralism. My students are Hindu, Jain, uh, Sikh, they're Confucian. Um, they're also various um, strains of Christianity and a lot are atheists. And so the mission field really has come here. In some ways, it's a, it's a great thing. I think that is a great thing. Um, the, the really bad side of pluralism is that our government educates most young people. And the, the line that we get in the schools is that this is somehow a neutral educational experience um, as far as answering the fundamental questions of life. But that's not the case at all. What really is preached in our schools is the worldview of secular humanism. And so what we see is p kids are indoctrinated into that worldview, basically under this guise of pluralism, you know, because our country is so diverse, we have religious freedom, we're not going to talk about religion in schools. So by default, we teach secular humanism. And that is just destroying the church. I, I shouldn't say destroying um, according to Barna, I don't remember the exact stat, but it's somewhere around 43 or 50 percent of millennials think it's actually wrong to preach the gospel. OK, millennial Christians, because they've bought into this pluralistic postmodern concept that all truth is valid, which that statement makes no sense because there's truth and then there's untruth. Uh, so our schools are it's just like this cauldron of postmodern thought. You hear this all the time when people be like, you do you, man, or hey, you live your truth, I'll live mine. That's sort of what, what I see with pluralism. That's good. So to both, both of you guys, tell us um, a little bit about Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, super important guy who we to be, you know, modeling a lot of our lives or our lives after what what outreach techniques um he uses to speak to people in, in athens the people around him go ahead well some of the things i'll basically say and brian could speak to this a little bit more but um we see that he builds bridges uh, one of the things that we are used to, and I talk a little bit about this on Sunday. I, I want to encourage you, maybe we'll put the link uh, to Sunday's sermon in the description on this video. But, um, but Paul does not engage with them in a way where he dehumanizes them, makes them feel stupid for, di for having a different belief than him. What Paul does is he actually understands our culture and he spends time. It, it, we, we see in the first uh, 16 through 18 verses of Acts 17, we see that, first of all, he sees the city full of idols. He's distressed by it. And so he's moved to introduce and invite people to consider Jesus, who has transformed his life, and he does it by dialogue. And we talked a little bit about that. Uh, in, in, the, Brian talked a little bit about that. He'll talk a little bit more, but he engages in dialogue. And the dialogue that he engages in that leads him up into the Areopagus Council, uh, up on the hill, 
that dialogue is what he continually does is instead of him pinning and this is really really hard for for <laughs> for us here in America in 2022 uh, instead of him pinning himself against them and saying here's where we're different and you're wrong he begins building bridges and saying I saw this uh, I see you have a statue to an unknown God well let me give you a take or an idea or a way in which maybe I could present a vision of this unknown God because you believe in unknown gods. So he's building these bridges to them, utilizing their language, their ways, and their belief systems, uh, as opposed to saying, hey, you're a bunch of pagans. What you're doing is sending you to hell. I'm right and you're wrong. And so I would say that that's one thing that we see that really challenges our techniques and the way we think through outreach. But Brian, yeah. Um, I think the starting point for me would be the difference between general revelation and special revelation, uh, which a lot of the listeners probably have not heard of. So God reveals himself in really two overarching ways. The first is accessible to everyone. We call it general revelation. Um, Psalm 19 is the perfect example, right? The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, uh, the work of his hands, okay? Nature is part of general revelation. That's God revealing himself to humanity. Another key aspect of general revelation is morality, this sense of right and wrong that we all have um, deep inside of us. And so the point to take away here is that some of God's truth is accessible to all people, all cultures, all places, all times. Special revelation <clears throat> is scripture or it's God appearing to you, okay? Like Paul on the road to Damascus. So the Israelites, and Paul was one, had access to special revelation. The Athenians had access to general revelation. So what I see Paul really doing in Acts 17 is he's building a bridge from general revelation to special revelation. Uh, N.T. Wright says, all truth is God's truth, no matter where we find it. And so what Paul has done is he has found out what's important to his audience, to the Athenians, which is some of their poetry, in this case, Epimenides and Eratus, their, their poems. And so he's mined this poetry for like, God's truth nuggets, if you will, okay? Augustine, by the way, said the same thing. We need to mine pagan philosophy for God's truth and then use that to build a bridge to Jesus Christ. Um, so that's what I see Paul doing for sure. I think some good evidence of that is the use of the word dialegomai in, in Acts, uh, so, so as I said before, this was the word that was frequently used for Socrates, okay? We see it the first time in Acts just before Paul gets to Athens. He uses it in Thessalonica first. Uh, and so I actually, I went through the book of Acts and I found all of the instances where dialegami was used and I plotted them on a map and they were all congregated around Athens. It was like the closer Paul got to Athens, the more likely he was going to use this specific uh, way to talk to people. Paul's ministry starts really in Acts 13, and he uses dialegomai in Acts 17 for the first time. Okay. Wow. And, uh, you know, he uses it again towards the end of Acts. He does use it in, in Caesarea, Philipp or Caesarea, but... He's actually saying, I didn't use dialegomai in the temple, okay? Uh, so I think we see Paul sort of adapting how he shares the gospel based on his audience, and I think we'd call that contextualization. How, how could that look like today for, like, the average uh, Christ follower? And then also, I mean, I could speak to the churches, but I, I'd be curious what, what that would mean for the average Christ follower, maybe the family person. Let me share an example from school first, because uh, that's always easier for me. So I get to teach Adventures of Huckleberry Finn in my AP US history class, which you wouldn't think is about God, right? Mark Twain wasn't really a Christian, okay? 
But what do we, like the book is full of general revelation. What do we see in this book? Huck escapes with Jim, who's a slave, and his conscience is just eating him up. He thinks he's the worst person in the world because he's helping a slave escape. Of course, reading it now, we're all like, woohoo, good job, Huck. Uh, but he almost turns Jim in multiple times. But the more time he spends with Jim on this raft, the more he learns about his family, the more he sees Jim sacrificing himself for Huck, like staying up, staying up all night so Huck can sleep, the more uh, Huck's heart starts to change. And so what we see in this book is Huck, he rejects the civil law of the South. Because what did the South say? The South said slavery is good. What did Huck's heart tell him? His heart told him, which we know, you know, the moral law is implanted in us. Scripture tells us Huck's heart told him that slavery was wrong. So he ends up saying, you know, the law of the South be darned. I'm going to help Jim, even if I go to hell. That's what Huck says. You know, he's not very advanced theologically here. Uh, but what do we learn from this? We learn that there is a law that transcends civil law. Okay, so with my students in a secular school, I'm able to say, you know, does is there a law that transcends civil law? If there's not, how could we condemn slavery? How could we condemn the Holocaust? Which, let me be clear, those thing, are things we should condemn. Uh, and if there is a law written on our hearts, where does that come from? Of course, it comes from God. And so that's how I would use the general revelation, a, a pagan text, to sort of share the gospel and, and make students think. Um, I, th I th think next you asked sort of how do we do that in our everyday lives? Yeah. Is that true? Okay, so I was talking with my, uh, my wife, Elizabeth, shout out today about this because I think she's better at this than me. I sort of exist in this bubble where I get to like recreate Athens in my classroom, right? I, I force the students to read these texts. Most Americans aren't going around reading Republic or Timaeus. Uh, so uh, Liz, my wife, she said this. She said, go where people go where people are, find the general revelation and what they are interested in, and then sort of build bridges um, from there. And so when we were discussing this this morning, we thought a lot of Americans were really interested in justice, in love, identity, and acceptance. Uh, and one thing she said that which I thought was great is Starbucks shouldn't be a more accepting place than church. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, that's no, what that's perfect. I love that. <clears throat> that's so good. Sounds like something she would say. That's yeah. great. I'm going to ask you this one, David. Um, something interesting about um, Paul's sermon in, um, in Acts 17 is that he didn't use the name of Jesus. And why do you think that is? Yeah, uh, let me pull, pull it up. Pull it up. Let me pull it up. Pull it up. <laughs> and, uh, and read just that last little bit. I believe it's 30 and no, verses 30 and 31. Yep, in the, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. And then 31, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof to this to everyone by raising him, or some say this man, from the dead. So I would say uh, th there's kind of three ways to look at this. Honestly, there were two ways I was looking at this. And then Brian uh, offered me kind of another perspective that was fantastic as well. So there's kind of three ways. The first I would say is kind of uh, some, of, some of the, I would say, more reformed camps. And even John Stott points to kind of their perspective is, well, you kind of got to know about the nature of God 
before you know you need a savior. And you got to know that God is holy and perfect and he's a judge. And we see in Isaiah 6, right, when, when Isaiah sees the glory of God, what does he do? He falls down and he says, woe to me, right, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And there's a moment of atonement where he goes forth in confidence. So there, there is a camp that would say, well, part of the reason why he doesn't introduce the name of Jesus here is he needs to understand the nature of God. And that's, uh, that's very common. Uh, and that's very common in how we think about presenting the gospel. What I will say to this, and this is, this is just my thoughts on that, is that idea is nowhere in the book of Acts in any presentation of the gospel. In any presentation of the gospel. The, the other thing I want to say is I'm very careful in some of those theological positions to separate the Trinity. I think it's a heresy to separate the Trinity, to pen, say that the, the Father is not the same as the Son. When Jesus says, I and the Father are one, right? He says, if you see the Father, you see me. And we see that in Hebrews 1. We see that in John 1. Uh, we see that in uh, Colossians 1, where the, the full image of God is seen in Christ. So if we're going to proclaim the nature of God, why wouldn't we proclaim Christ? Why would we hold off on it? And so that's my perspective on that. Um, the, the perspective that you, that you uh, presented to me was fascinating because what we see is in the verses, in verse 16 through 18, we see that Paul is proclaiming the good news in the marketplace. Which means they would have, as they brought him up to Areopagus, they would have already heard it. And one thing that you mentioned too, which I thought was fascinating, is, I mean, Acts is uh, just a snapshot of this sermon in just a couple verses, where N.T. Wright was saying that this sermon most likely was two hours long. And so we only see a snapshot of it. And then one of the things that we're not used to, uh, we, we run Alpha, the Alpha course here, where we leave people with questions to be asked. Um, one of the perspectives that you presented was that, that Paul was leaving them with questions to be asked. So when he makes statements, he wants them to ask more about this man and this Jesus. Now, I want to offer you kind of the position that I hold. I've seen some of the early church fathers and early Christianity speak into, and then I've seen different theologians like Brad Jerzak, who's Canadian. He's a, a Eastern Orthodox guy, and then another guy, Brian Zahn, who's a pastor in Missouri, present, and that's uh, this concept that Plato gets to in the Republic of this just man or this righteous man who basically civilization will turn on. And at a certain point, here's one of the quotes from the Republic. Plato's a Republic. This is, I believe, in a dialogue with Socrates, if I understand it correctly. And this is what it says. It says, and this is, this is you got to realize, over 300 years before Jesus, which, you know, as you're talking about, Plato kind of points to some of these revelations of Jesus, hundreds of years before Jesus. And here's what this says. It says, our just man will be scourged, racked, fettered, and at last, after all manner of suffering, will be crucified. So my belief and kind of where I take it is that this man that he's talking about is pointing to this just man. Now, when we look at the Gospels, when Jesus was crucified, we see in Matthew and in Mark, it says, surely this man was the Son of God. But the same author of Acts was Luke who authored the Gospel of Luke. And here's how the Gospel of Luke says it. This is right after Jesus' death. This is Luke 23, 47. It says, The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And so I believe what Paul is doing is Paul is building yet another bridge to their understanding and bringing them into Jesus by saying, Hey, not only has this played out that he was scourged, he was racked, he was fettered, and he was crucified, but then he proclaims that he was then raised from the dead. He takes it a step farther. So that's my perspective on that. Can I just support you with a, quote, with a yeah. quote here? So I've got yep. uh, an awesome text by Louis Marcos called From Plato to Christ. And uh, Louis Marcos, he's a really 
famous uh, professor, sort of in the, the strain of C.S. Lewis. He's at Houston Baptist. He says, quote, It was, I believe, God's plan and God's grace to use the writings of Plato to prepare the Greco-Roman world for the greater revelation to come so that when it came, they would recognize it as the fulfillment of what they had already learned from Plato. Such is the thesis of the sermon that Paul preached to the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers at the Areopagus in Athens, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, I declare to you. Wow. Well, let me ask this last question of David Martinez. He's our worship pastor, which means he shapes, when people gather, he shapes the the language, the songs, the ways in which we worship as a community of followers of Jesus. And one of the things we're aware of when we worship is that there's people in the room that also are not quite there yet or might sit within some of these pluralistic city systems that are seeking. On top of that, one of the things that we see with like Amos and Isaiah is a call to worship in a way in which you are aware of the people outside of your walls. And so when it comes to this idea of building bridges and contextualizing, just like Paul contextualized his message to the people of Athens, what does that same sort of contextualization practice mean for when we worship? What, what does that mean for our elements, our music styles, and our methods as we worship together? Yeah, it's something I give a great deal of thought to and have for a number of years now. Um, it, it might seem to some as though we just kind of pick some, some random songs and get up on stage and play them. And, um, but no, there's a lot of thought and intentionality that, that, that goes into um, our services and our worship um, experiences and our and our expression, and I think just as we've talked about so many times, context is so important. Um, and I've served at a few different churches now, and uh, it's been different every time. I haven't carried my own just preferences in. You know, I carry a little bit of it. Obviously, I'm going to be passionate about certain songs over others or um, certain instrumentation. But I, what's it's so important is to go into um, a place that varies by city by city, state by state. Um, there, there will be a known and a felt uh, culture that's there. And it's a, that's important, I think, to, to pay attention to. Um, and so what we do here at Life Church is even very different from the, from the last church. I would say significantly different from the last church that, that both David and I served in together. Um, and so, uh, like, I'm, like I was saying, you know, I mean, looking at, at Paul, um, and in, in First Corinthians chapter nine, where he, he says, I, "I I belong to no one. I'm I'm free, um, but I become a slave to to everyone. I become a servant to everyone, to the Jews. When I'm with the Jews, I become like the Jews. Um, when I'm with those who are under the law, I become like those who are under the law, so that I might win them. And and I think sometimes that way of thinking can be scary to us as Christians because it's like, oh, I thought we were supposed to be in the world, not of the world kind of thing. It can almost feel like we're teetering on, on something dangerous by doing that, like yep. hanging out with the wrong crowd or something. Um, but uh, it, it's important to understand, I think, uh, culturally what's going on around us. Like, and music is a huge piece of that, all the way from, you know, Gregorian chants, you know, um, up and up until now, you know, in, in, with choral music and and hymns and and then guitars make their way into the equation and then drums make their way into the equation um, oftentimes uh, Christian music or uh, sacred music uh, worship music lots of ways that you could you could um, define it um, tends to mirror what's going on in 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 the culture at, of that time um, and so for those who are going to be coming into this room who have never been in a church um, I believe that a lot of the elements, uh, the textures, the way the way things sound, um, should be something that their their ears have already been attuned to, um, and the instrumentation. So that way, it's not kind of like, whoa, what did I just step into? You know, because um, music is is very very powerful. It's a powerful thing that God has given us. That I think even instrumental music is moving, um, and so that's why I think instrumentally, um, and and the style and genres of music that we use oftentimes reflect kind of what's going on even in, in non-Christian music. Um, but then the songs that we choose 
you know the words the words are i think what what are extremely extremely important mm. to to not um you know forget about and david and i have a lot of conversations about that and and sometimes even songs that we originally thought like these would be great to sing um david has picked my brain a little bit and he's like well i don't know how that really helps um shape uh people's thought process on on the character of god and that's extremely important mm -hmm. something that we don't even realize we can we can unknowingly um, contribute to people's incorrect views of the character of God, and so we pay a lot of a, a lot of attention to that here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm rambling now, but as as you can see, a lot of these thoughts are always swirling in in my head. What what is helpful um, for people to to worship in a way where um, we talk a lot about up in and and out? What what is a helpful way for people to come into a place where they have this up? Uh, relationship with God where it's just exaltation it's it's it is um, adoration it's just it, it's 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 kind of like the posture of the the angel singing holy 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 just worship because he is God but then there's that in that inward moments where we you know we're able to um, have God search our hearts maybe that's those are moments where conviction happens um, where, where we experience growth inwardly but then there's that out piece what does our worship send us to do after we come and gather on on a Sunday or after we listen to our we do our you know morning devotionals or we listen to our um, Christian music what is that sending us to do um, we think very intentionally about all those things so even our building I know you can't see because the cameras are on us you know our building has windows open to our world around us so that we're actually a lot of worship rooms are just darkened and it's so intentional that we even have a globe off in the corner that, that it's not a, like a globe globe. It's a, it's, you see through it. It's, it's on what, it, what's that stuff called? It's, it's, it's plastic. And so you can see through it so that as we're worshiping, we're also, we have the world and the light, the sunlight comes in. There's an awareness of our world around us. And, uh, I think, I think that was very that's, a, that's an awesome, intentional uh, thing that we, we want to keep as well. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about, you use the term uh, formation. Um, how, what, t talk a little bit about the line of both kind of evangelism, uh, formation, and expression in worship. How does all that play out? You, yep. Yeah, I think uh, sometimes we can, um, in our time that we have on Sunday mornings, our, our services, we can, we can tend to hang our hat a little bit too much on, um, how, how cool we are, you know, like, how, and in, in a, in an attempt to be evangelistic, um, we try to have the, we can tend to ha try to have the most, um, popular songs being played, um, at least within the, the Christian, um, world or, or even play, you know, top 40 songs and in, in an attempt to attract people into our church. Um, but it, it's, it's difficult because you, you, you are trying to, to uh, do something that um, enhances the experience for a non-believer to come in and, and, and experience God. Um, so, so it is evangelistic in nature, but then there's also a number of people who have been, um, they've been Christ followers for, for many, many years. And they're in the room too. And they have, they have the need to be around other believers singing the same songs, being united in song. Um, and so we usually get time for four, maybe five songs. Um, and within that, it is, um, it is a time for, uh, for formation to happen, the, the up, the, the in and the out. Um, and also a time for, for people to, because I can't even tell you how many times, and I'm sure you guys have heard this too, it's, it's like, you'll hear people say, you know, I love the message, but I really experience God through the worship. Well, I think they're saying a lot of things when they say that. I think they're, um, they're having an emotional experience, um, which is not a bad thing. I could go on forever about that. I don't think that's a bad thing to have an emotional experience. It's what we do with that emotional experience. Um, but they're, you know, the, the word of God is penetrating their minds and their hearts through song. And oftentimes it's, it's through less words than they even get in a message. And so I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And, uh, coming from like an Anglican and liturgical background, you, you trust the Holy spirit and the elements to do the work, even within the fact, yes, there's a sermon being preached, 
but you you trust that through the elements of the singing and and the prayers uh, that the Holy Spirit is 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 doing the work. So yeah, I, I often will say it on a, on a Sunday when we're in our response time. No matter what sermon was was preached, no matter what songs were sung, it's amazing that God is faithful to still. Um, speak to, to every different person, you know, in a way that they were needing to, to hear it. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. I, what you said about formation really reminded me of Republic uh, by Plato. And so they're trying to build the perfect city in this dialogue. <clears throat> and so they're talking about the education of young people and they start to talk about music, which for the Greeks was stories, poetry and music. And uh, Plato gets so intense that he even wants to control like, the types of melodies that, that young people can listen to. And they decide they're going to censor everything because there's all these songs that aren't reflective of truth. And there's all these stories that aren't reflective of truth. And so I think Plato would agree with you that music is extremely important for spiritual formation. My question to you, sorry to put you on the spot, no would be... Like you said, you, you get four songs in here on Sunday morning and then people leave and especially young people, they're listening to the top 40 a billion times on repeat. Not that all that music is bad, but a message is sinking in, if that makes sense. And so how do we how do we combat that? Or I mean, I might, I might be you know using the wrong word there when I say combat because like I want to get aggressive about it. But I guess how do you disciple people so that they'll actually understand how important the music is and what's going on and that maybe some of the music they're listening to is is not helping them absolutely uh so i think it, it's kind of going back to paul talking about when i'm with the jews i'm like the jews um it's 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 being able to have i think a lot of what he's saying is ha have friends like ha have people who who think differently than you do um, maybe maybe hold things with a little bit of a lighter hand when it comes to listening to to music that could be um, that is forming us in these other ways. But something that I find interesting, I love. It's like one of my love languages to share music with each other. And oftentimes, when I share music with people, it's not worship music. Yeah. Um, and so I think being able to have the under the understanding to put to put music in in these different buckets where it's like, okay, this is music that the truth of what's being said I will allow to to form my mind. This yeah. is stuff that I just think sounds really cool, yeah. um, but also helps me understand what's happening around me. So that way I can further understand um, what what people are dealing with. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times in, in songs, um, a lot of the top 40 songs, they're, they're talking about real human emotion, real, yeah. real heartbreak, real hurt. Um, and understanding that is, it's like, I mean, I experienced that stuff too, even though... There's general revelation there too. There really is. It's, it's fascinating. And so even with some of our worship team members, um, a lot of the music we share with each other is not worship music. We do that too. But I think being able to have that balance um, in that relationship, and be, it's, it's a huge teaching moment to be able to say like, wow, isn't this artist amazing? Yeah. But like, we're not, we're not going to, um, you know... We're not going to allow them to be the one that speak into our lives the, the truth, you know? Does that make sense? So maybe the, the discipleship piece is just sort of opening up people's minds to the fact that this stuff is forming them. And they have to sort of be on guard and use discretion. Just the same way we do with uh, TV shows or movies. And um, I think it's important for us to know what, you know, personally, what we what is good for us to consume and what is not. Yeah. Um, that could vary a little bit for each and every one of us, but yeah. Sorry to hijack the conversation. No, no, it's good. Yeah, I mean, do you guys have any other any other thoughts on on this stuff? This is this is good. I do. Uh, it could go down rabbit trails, but the biggest thing is, I think one of the hardest thing is sometimes the top forty stuff tends to hit more of the human elements and human experience than even some of our worship songs do. And so I think one of the things you do a really good job of, but I know it's tough, uh, is finding songs that, that do that, that, that hit more of the human experience 
than what some of the worship songs are out there. So that's really just a comment. That's not really a question. But but I think you do a really good job of that. But uh, that is hard. That's why the other music is so attractive because it hits. It talks about certain things that sometimes our worship music yeah. wow, doesn't yeah. talk about. Absolutely. So yeah. Yeah, there. A, a lot of times those songs can mirror a little bit more what we see in the Psalms. With you know, it's a, a lament and being able to just rage. lay. Yeah, <laughs> rage. You just lay lay it all out there. We we you know, we 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 listen to that stuff and we're like, I can I can see me in that. I can feel me <laughs> in that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been such a great conversation. I'm sure we could keep talking about all this for forever. Um, but we're, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap it up now. Thanks, David. Thanks, Brian. Um, we're, we're hoping to be doing this kind of stuff a lot more in the in the future. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. And uh, I really want to invite you, if you're if you're not a part of our church here and um, you enjoy this kind of stuff, uh, continue to, you can go to lifechurchpeoria.com um, and you can find different ways to be plugged in with us on, you know, our, for our online experience, for other things going on in our church, we would love to invite you into any of that. And, and if not, that's okay too. You can just kind of come and hang out with us when we ramble on and have conversations like this. But thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you guys next time.